Hi everyone, this is Jake. Um, I'm going to be doing my presentation on T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. T.S. Eliot was born in 1888 and he died in 1965. He was born in Missouri and he wrote The Love Song in 1911 when he was just 23 years old. It was published in 1915 um, and this was around the time when he was in constant contact with it, what would be his first wife, Emily Hale, and he was telling her that he loved her. It would have been interesting, I think, to see how this poem would have turned out if he'd written it when he'd already met Emily uh, and how his views on love would have changed. Um, his 20s overall were a big time of discovery for him. He eventually moved to Britain and he would eventually renounce his American citizenship and become a British citizen. And he would, right before leaving, uh, admit that he loved Emily. But again, this was after he'd actually written the poem. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon it back, and soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be a time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for the works and days of hands that lift and drop question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions, before the taking of toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare, time to turn back and descend the stair, with a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say, how his hair is growing thin, my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a single pin, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all. I've known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I am formulated and sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with little brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress, arms that lie along a table or wrapped around a shawl, and should I then presume, and how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of, lo of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floor of silent seas. And the afternoons, the evenings, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And, and would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, 
Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sun sets in the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been a worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning towards the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use, Polit politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old. The sh I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combining the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows, the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, Till human voices wake us, and we drown. So what is the poem trying to convey? Um, I think I've narrowed down the five main themes of the poem to loving yourself is very hard, understanding the opposite sex, flaws weigh heavy on the mind, time is limited, and the overarching theme that love is not so simple. Starting with loving yourself is very hard, flaws weigh heavy on the mind, um, Eliot's character, Proofrock, in the poem has a hard time accepting himself. He compares himself to Michelangelo, um, and I believe he's actually comparing himself to uh, David. Michelangelo is David, the perfect man. So uh, they say, in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. I think he means they're talking of a man other than himself, a perfect man. And he compares himself to Hamlet here, um, but not in a vain way. He says, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was I meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool. He's saying he's merely an advisor. He's not the star of the show. He's not the great romancer that Hamlet was, but just an advisor to great men. Uh, and again, this was not. If these are not vain comparisons. He's actually saying that he's inferior. Um, he mentions his hair thinning constantly. Uh, that seems to be the main flaw that he focuses on throughout the poem. Um, on every page he mentions it, uh, whether it be a bald spot or hair thinning. And you can tell that this is a, um, a problem that carries on all the way through when he talks about, um, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? He's, he's questioning everything. Uh, by the end of the poem in his life, he's too nervous to do anything. He's, he's questioning every single decision. Should I eat this peach? Should I part my hair this way or that way? When it really... It doesn't matter. So understanding the opposite sex and the idea that time is limited. Um, in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Again, they're talking of David, the perfect man, and they're not talking of him. He has a hard time, I think, understanding what women want, and he's kind of voicing that frustration in this poem. Um, he says he'll have time to meet women in romance, but goes his whole life without doing so. He... He constantly says, oh, there will be time for this, time for that, time for you and time for me, he says. Um, he's talking always about how there will be time. But then by the end, he says, I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. And by this point in the poem, he's realizing almost that he's out of time. He's reached the end of his life. And this is kind of what his life has been. Um, he speaks of having known women throughout the poem, especially on page two. Uh, but in reality, he has he has no chance with these women. He's talking about how he knows, he's known their eyes already, he's known their arms. But then again, he's talking about how 
he he grows bald. He's he he just can't make it, you know. He's overthinking everything. He sees all of his flaws, and he he decides I am not worthy of these women. Which brings us to the last point, which is that love is not so simple. This whole poem seems to poke fun at the kind of happy-go-lucky sonnets and whatnot that were written by um, poets of yesteryear. They're almost he's almost poking fun at the simple view of love, how it's just two people meet and they're perfect for each other and they fall in love. He's almost showing the other side of people who maybe can't find someone as easily as readily. Maybe they have uh, flaws that they feel are holding them back. And he's kind of voicing those frustrations. Um, some of the many things in the poem that, uh, that point to not finding love so simple. Uh, on one one, it's been said that he's talking about prostitution when he talks of uh, restless nights and one night cheap hotels. People say he's talking about sleeping with women for, for money. And of course, this is kind of a belittling of the idea of love or making love. And he goes on to talk about female flaws on two. And he's talking about how under the light, he sees the brown little hairs. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong page. He's talking about how, but in the lamplight, down with little brown hairs. And this almost is reminiscent of the poem that we read in class where the author uh, is talking about a man who sneaks into a woman's dressing room and he finds that she's human. You know, she has human problems. Um, and this kind of reminds me of that. But still, he says, is it perfume from a dress? He recognizes these flaws, but he says, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? What is this? these emotions that overcome me when I'm in the presence of a woman? And uh, he just has problems, it seems, uh, conveying himself to women. Lastly, he talks about male fl his male flaws throughout the poem, but especially on three, he's just talking about how, should I part my hair this way? Should I eat a peach? And throughout the poem, he's constantly talking about how his hair is thinning, his arms are thin. Um, right here, he says, uh, um, oh, I apologize. Uh, right here, he says, how my hair is going thin. He talks about how his arms and legs are thin. And um, when in reality, these are things probably he is the one who notices the most. This is probably things that he is the most um, aware of. And yeah, he's basically just trying to say love is ugly. That's what this whole poem seems to boil down to. It's talking about how some people have these deep insecurities that make it hard for them, them to find someone, to even have the courage to go approach someone. And it's a bit of a warning, too. He's warning people, you will grow old. There is not always time in the future for you to do these things. And um, I think that's what makes uh, this poem 